Hello, and welcome to the BYU Family History Library webinar series. We're glad you could join us today. I'm Bryant, and I'll be your host for this webinar. Please make sure your microphones and web cameras are just dis disabled during the presentation to provide for a smooth recording. If you have technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box and I can address your concerns. You are welcome to use the chat box during the webinar for comments and insights. However, all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Our next webinar is on May 8th, and that will be Utah G Digital Newspapers with Jeremy Minty, and that's Friday at 4 p.m. If you'd like to access a previous webinar, please visit our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded by the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to recordings and other updates on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. For today's webinar, we're pleased to hear from James Tanner, who will be giving a presentation on how to analyze genealogical sources. James has over 32 years experience in genealogical research and is an avid blogger of Genealogy Star blog and rejoice and be exceedingly glad. He has presented at expos and conferences around the US and Canada. He served for 10 years as a missionary at the Mesa, Arizona Family Search Library and is currently serving at the BYU Family History Library. James has seven children, 34 grandchildren, and one great-grandchild. If James is ready, then we'll turn the time over to him. Thanks. Here I am. Well, today we're going to talk about how to analyze genealogical sources. Uh, you're welcome to hear to, uh, from the BYU Family History Library. Uh, during the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, we are all broadcasting from home or other locations. The Family History Library, as, as all of the BYU campus has been closed now for some weeks and uh, looks like it's going to be closed for the rest of this summer. So we are uh, still going to continue doing uh, webinars all during the summer, probably and <clears throat> as long as we're able to do so. Um, this is a pretty an interesting and important topic. Uh, it's not something that uh, comes naturally to, uh, to people as they begin to do their, genealog their genealogical research. It's a topic about that is a learned skill. It's something that you actually have to consciously think about and consciously learn in order to uh, be effective. Um, first of all, before you ever get started um, doing genealogical research or, or attempting to analyze documents, I would strongly recommend that you know your history. And one of the histories that might be helpful, uh, along with the histories of the places where your ancestors lived uh, and the specific locations and local histories of where they lived, is to know a little bit about the history of genealogy as a subject. Genealogy uh, has been around for uh, possibly thousands of years. Obviously, there are genealogies in the Bible and in uh, other ancient documents. Uh, that go way back into antiquity. But the idea of doing genealogy as a popular activity for which people are individually involved has not, uh, has become only popular in the last hundred years or so. And this is one book, and it I'm not aware of any others, but this is the main book about the history of genealogy in America. And you might be very, very surprised if you were to get a hold of this book and read it. I know it's available online and it's online for sale at a not too expensive price. And it may even be some used version, uh, uh, copies of it available on Amazon. But uh, it is very worth the trouble. Here's the uh, uh, entire uh, citation information uh, written by Francois Wheel. Actually, Ville, he is French, and he wrote this about the United States, but it's a, a very, very in-depth look at how genealogy got to where it is today. Um, that's really the basis of, of understanding what's going on. 
Now, this is kind of an interesting statement. It was made by George Santiana um, not too many years ago, but it's those who do not remember the past are doomed to repeat it. There's a lot of variations on this quote and a lot of attributions, but I track this down to uh, what we think is the original, uh, the original uh, quote. What this actually means is that unless we understand the history of genealogy, and unless we understand the history of how people uh, came to be interested in searching out their ancestors and the methodologies that have evolved, um, basically, as you learn genealogy, as I did many, many years ago, uh, you are doomed to repeat it. In other words, you have to go back through and understand all of the different um, methodologies and, and things that are that were available and learn about the about the subject to the point where you can uh, where you feel like you can do research, contribute, and understand what's going on. Um, there's kind of a, a, a concept out there that's been popularized that everyone can, you don't need to do, uh, be a genealogist to do genealogy. Uh, you don't need to understand uh, the history, the background, and the, on all of that of the families. Uh, it's just sort of a, a pastime that you can do in your spare time. Uh, most of us who have done genealogy for any extended period of time would uh, possibly and probably quite uh, uh, forcefully disagree with those kinds of an assessment. Genealogy is a very complex subject. It takes uh, a, a fair amount of study and learning just to become, un just to understand some of the basics. Uh, it's not a matter of just filling in names on a family group sheet or on a pedigree. It is. Uh, it brings to bear a whole bunch of different subjects and different uh, and different things, from geography to map reading to all sorts of things. And we'll, I'll mention this again as I as I go through the presentation today. Um, first of all, before you even get started with the concept of analyzing uh, historical or genealogically important documents. Uh, you need to mind your jargon. Now, jargon is a uh, specialized words or terms used by particular profession or groups that are difficult for others outside of the profession or group to understand. Uh, if you are in any group, even if you're if you don't really understand how you uh, are in a group, you will probably have your own jargon uh, that goes to everybody from dog groomers to race car drivers to scientists to uh, professionals of all types. Everyone has their uh, their very specialized jargon um, terms and words that they use that uh, are not used by those outside of that particular profession. I happened to belong to a profession during my active uh, legal career. I was an attorney for 39 years. Uh, and on top of that, I was primarily a trial attorney, which meant that I was involved in a tremendously complex system of jargon of words that were specialized and had almost no meaning. Many of the words that are used by attorneys uh, sound like common words, like words that you would use on a kind of an everyday basis. But in the term, in the concept of um, in working with and in concepts of legal of the legal community, they have specialized meanings and are used by attorneys and lawyers in a specialized way. So this is something that's very important. And yes, genealogists have a lot of their own jargon. So not knowing the jargon of the genealogists is one of the first kind of steep learning curves that uh, people run into when they start hearing about family group records and they start learning about online family trees and they start learning about pedigrees and they start learning about all of the different things that they're taught, DNA and all the DNA jargon. Uh, there's just a, a lot of, of just words to learn about and to understand when you're when you begin to do genealogy. 
Um, I'm going to have to use this, and this, of course, is I'm going to have to identify this as my opinion, and it's my opinion as uh, a practicing trial attorney for most of my life, uh, that I think it's unfortunate that genealogists have adopted some of the legal jargon. Uh, how this came about, uh, it came about simply because there were attorneys and lawyers who were interested in genealogy, and they applied their legal background to the research and genealogical research. Um, there is also an overlay of historical jargon from the history people, the professors, academics, uh, professional historians, writers, but that is, uh, it has for up till now had far less impact on the genealogical community. What does have, this have to do with analyzing documents? Well, Unfortunately, the legal jargon, uh, a lot of it has to do about analyzing sources. Um, when you're talking about looking at a uh, historical document, let me just say like a birth certificate or a, a probate file or any of those things, uh, you're going to run into a lot of specialized terminology. But when genealogists talk about those, uh, documents and they talk about analyzing those documents and determining uh, whether they're accurate or not accurate or whether they believe the information or they don't believe the information then they start using terms that may or may not be familiar to you but are uh, sort of an undercurrent of the uh, of the genealogical community and you're likely to run into them especially if you start to get into discussions about analyzing sources. Here's some of those words, primary, a primary document versus a secondary source or document. Evidence as a, as a term that's used uh, about information that you obtain from historical records. Original versus derivative, an original document versus a derivative document, sort of the same as primary versus secondary, but these are different terms that are used. Uh, sometimes you'll hear uh, that you need to consider whether or not this is correct beyond a reasonable doubt or clear if this evidence is clear and convincing or whether it is based on a preponderance of the evidence. These are all legal terms. Uh, and ultimately, the word proof, which is used uh, very, very frequently uh, in the context of of working with historical documents and uh, particularly by genealogists working with historical documents. So where do, how do I recognize? Well, basically during the time that I was practicing as a trial attorney, I, during my entire practice, I had a book that was always within arm's length. It was called The Rules of Civil Procedure. There was also another book that was within arm's length that was called The Rules of Criminal Procedure. And these were the methodologies used by attorneys to take matters to court and to present cases before, uh, before various agencies and courts and things. Okay, so these rules of civil procedure and criminal procedure both contained uh, a sections called the rules of evidence. And the rules of evidence were very specific about how evidence is presented in court and considered by a judge. And those terms that we see and that I see here in front of us uh, that I put up on the screen are specifically defined in um, the rules of evidence and uh, considered by courses to be courts to be uh, spe specialized legal terms. So basically, what I'm kind of, uh, not kind of, but what I'm uh, advocating here is that, advocating here is that you kind of divorce yourself a little bit from using these terms and start look, thinking about analyzing records in a different way uh, than sounds like you would want to do. The reason for this is fundamental, and that is that when a person goes to court and presents testimony and evidence to a judge, the idea is that everything you do implies that a judge is, is there who will then decide what is correct. So as I prepare a case or prepared a case during the time I was actively doing so, prepared cases for court, 
the whole idea was that at some point in time, I would be before a judge or I would be before a jury and they would make a decision as to whether what I was saying was true or not true or correct or incorrect. And at the same time, there would always be someone on the opposite side, almost always, there would be someone on the opposite side, uh, or at least the judge would be the person I would have to convince. But the others, and if there, if there was an opposite side, for example, there would always be another attorney out there who would be telling the court something different. He would be advocating a different side of the case. This is the, the advocacy uh, type of, of situation where you have people representing various interests. Now, uh, I'm not saying that genealogy can't get into a, a situation where there are disagreements, obviously that happens, but there are no judges. There's no system out there. There are no genealogical judges telling us ultimately that you are right and you're wrong and you win and you lose, which is the case in, in almost all lawsuits. Even if there was no other party, for instance, if it's a, what's called a, uh, just a case for a declaratory judgment or whatever, I still have to convince the judge that I'm correct and he has to agree with me. So in, in, I'm, I'm obviously never going to have my opposing counsel, the, the, the other attorney, agree with me. They just are professionally not going to agree with me unless we come to an agreement and settle the case. Obviously, those are situations that could occur. But in terms of genealogy, uh, why do we think that we have to prove our case to someone? Who are we proving it to? And the answer to that is pretty simple. Um, and and it's under, and understand this that the issue of maintaining genealogical and historical research methodology and not overlaying it and infusing that methodology with legal terms is more difficult than it would appear the the use of the terms proof and evidence and uh, burden of proof and the uh, uh, original versus copies and all of those kinds of things and, and derivative and things like those, all those terms that were developed and honed into very strict legal terminology have been applied sort of generally to the idea of analyzing historical documents. And I think that it creates more uh, difficulty than it solves and that there's really no reason to to think in those terms because that isn't what we're what we're doing who is the person that gets convinced it's entirely up to the researcher to evaluate the information and form an opinion about its veracity in other words you have to be you're the one that determines whether this particular dom document is correct or not and you use it as a, as a, as a source and you cite this document and, and tell people this is where you got your information, who's, who, you know, there's no genealogical police that are gonna come and arrest you and, and say, you, you are now charged with, uh, uh, you know, negligence or you're charged with some, some uh, uh, act of, of violating the, the laws of genealogy. It's entirely up to you. And this, this is also kind of the root of a lot of frustration among genealogists who, uh, who once they gain a, 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 a appreciable amount of understanding of the process of doing uh, genealogical and historical research are uh, mystified and frustrated to no end by people who do not seem to have the same level of understanding that they do. In other words, there's always uh, this this background noise in genealogy of people who who feel like they know what is correct and no one else seems to have that ability. Um, this is uh, uh, you know if, if you were uh, going if you had graduated from law school and began your practice of law, you would find out in the first week that nobody really believes anything you say and that everything you said would be. Uh, you know, being a lawyer, for example, uh, was in a situation where people would call, uh, where I would expect that, that every day I would go into the office and somebody would tell me I was stupid, that I didn't know what I was talking about, and that I was wrong. Uh, okay, so 
genealogists seem to be uh, absolutely offended and ready to quit the, the, the pursuit of genealogy simply because somebody disagrees about who, who, what date their grandmother was born on or somebody disagrees on the name of the wife of, uh, of one of their ancestors or some other I uh, historical issue. Uh, and uh, it's inevitable that they will uh, get a long list of, of, of historical citations and sit down and write uh, and say, I have absolutely proved that George was my grandfather. Okay, so that's kind of thing that we're talking about. So when we're analyzing the documents, we need to understand that there's a lot of things that we need to, to be concerned with. And becoming a good genealogist, however, is unfortunately uh, pretty similar to uh, becoming a, a good uh, lawyer or attorney. Law and genealogy take a significant amount of time, effort, and a lot of case law. Okay, and we're going to talk here just a minute about the idea of case law and how that comes into effect with genealogy. Actually, the most effective way to learn how to analyze any subject is through the case method. And case method, uh, maybe you've seen a, a, in the past, you may have seen a movie about uh, attending law school, or uh, you may have talked to somebody who went to law school or whatever. But uh, the whole idea in law school is they don't teach you the law, they teach you case law, which means you read case after case after case. And, and my estimate one, one time when I was in the middle of law school, uh, which by the way is usually around three years of post uh, uh, graduate work in college, that uh, we were looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of 20,000 cases a semester. So we looked at at case after case after case, day after day, hundreds, sometimes hundreds of cases in one day. And that was just incredible. I actually lost uh, a considerable degree. I had to get new glasses when I finished law school. I had done so much reading, it had strained my eyes. Um, so basically, how do, you, how do you apply this to genealogy? you're using case method when you look at thousands of records and documents. So the first time you pick up a document or see a uh, US federal census record or a census record from any other country or any other document out there, whether it's a, a parish register from uh, Latin America or a, a, t a tax record from some country around the world or a, a census record of, of whatever type or a birth certificate, a death certificate, any kind of historical record, um, a histor a history of a county where you've read a history, uh, any place where you're going to be able to get information about um, uh, your ancestors in a very specific historical way, um, you're using case method because as you look at that first document, it may seem unfamiliar to you after you've looked at a hundred birth certificates or you've looked at a thousand birth certificates, then you look, know immediately what to look at and what's there and what's not there and whether it's believable or not believable. And so uh, it's just a matter of time and handling a number of documents. So for example, if I were to say to you, you came to me and you said, I have looked for my, young, my great, great grandfather and I cannot find him. Uh, he's not in the census records. He actually lived right before the census and uh, uh, was instituted in 1790. And he's got a lot of, and he lived in this, in Virginia or wherever. And I say, Oh, have you checked the probate records? And you say, well, well, no, I haven't. What are probate records? Okay, so basically the idea of learning about doing, analyzing the records has to start with, with becoming familiar with the records and knowing what the, what the parameters are of each type of record. 
what are the kinds of information that you will find on a birth certificate or a death certificate? Certificate. What are the types of information that you will find on a, in a probate record? And what are you looking for when you look for a probate record? How do you read a will? And how do you understand the language of the will so that you can extract the information that's important about your family? These are things that I'm talking about, and these and this process comes about uh, for all of us, and by simply doing it, by simply looking at record after record after record after record. So when I see people putting information into online family trees where they make no citations and they they do list no sources then I can assume that they have not looked at any documents. They don't know what they're talking about. And as far as the information that they have entered into that family tree, it may as well have been make-believe and made up because there's no substantiation for that information. So this is what we're involved in. We're involved in, in answering certain questions about uh, the, um, the way that this, uh, this works. Um, you have a uh, first question is when, where did the event occur? So when you're talking about, uh, let's say you're looking for your great, great grandfather. And uh, the first thing you want to know is uh, what's his name? Where was he born? Uh, when was he born? And, and so forth. But when we start out looking for this information for our great, great grandfather, even before we know the name, even before we know the date for sure, even before we know any other information, we need to focus on where did the event occur. Now, why is that the case? The simple answer is that important and and uh, and useful genealogical documents and records were kept at or near the place that an event occurred by someone who either observed the event or had a duty to record that event. So before we start asking anything, we need to know where all of this information was uh, could and might be located and where we can start to look for it. So the second thing we ask are what are the levels of jurisdiction? What kinds of records could have been created? And, and uh, this word jurisdiction is, is, a, is a little bit technical, but it refers to the legal authority over a given area. So for example, uh, the, the, the simple way to understand this is where, when you answer the question of where an event occurred, then you have to understand what was the historical context of that, of that place? Who would be responsible or what entities would be responsible for keeping the records that might be pertinent to your family? So when you're looking at that, um, that place where the record, where the information, where the event occurred, then you're looking for the information that might have been gathered from that event and who would have been collecting it and storing it. So let's say, for example, that you're, I'm going to give one here in, in Utah, if uh, your ancestor got here and in, in, uh, was born in 1850 in some place in Utah, you would want to know where in Utah maybe he was born. How would you know that? Well, you work your way backward step by step. So where were his children born? Uh, where were his grandchildren born? In other words, as you work your way back up your pedigree from you yourself, you have to fasten it, fasten your attention on the places and then move carefully backward to see if that uh, document could have been created in that location. So if you're starting with your grandfather, your great grandfather, for example, you may want to know where your grandfather was born and that would give you an idea of where the family might be and where to start looking for records for your great grandfather. So each of the jurisdictions there, and we'll talk a little more about that in just a minute, are those places that you're going to look for. So what was the date of the event? This, this puts it, we're not talking about like 7th of June of 1775. We're talking about uh, an approximate time frame of when this document might have been corrected. Uh, 
uh, I mean, excuse me, created. So if we're thinking in terms of a specific document having been created, then we need to think of the time frame that that, that would happen. Now, if we have looking for a birth record, for example, uh, there's a lot you need to know about birth records, uh, just kind of a, a side here on birth records. Uh, most birth records in the United States did not begin to be kept until the, until the uh, 1900s, until the 20th century. And many did not, were not kept consistently by states or counties until the, well into the 1950s and 60s. So there's, you know, there's places where birth records are just not existent and as such, not the government type of birth certificate most people think of when they think of a birth record. So where do you go to get this? Well, that's all a different question of, of how to do research. But when we're focusing on the questions that are occur that we're asking, these are the questions we ask of the documents when we're looking at the document we're sent. Uh, so when we're looking at the certificate that says this was this person's birth certificate, we look and say, where did the event occur? Where was the birth? And who created this or what or jurisdiction created this birth certificate? What was the date of the birth? Who recorded the event on the birth certificate? Who gave the information that was there? Was that the person who was at the birth or was it someone later who recorded the information from someone else? When was the event recorded? How long after the um, the event did the record was the record created and how was the report preserved how do we have this why do we still have this record with us where did it come from um, if you were thinking in terms of the legal uh, uh, effects of this you would uh, um, think in terms of the chain of custody in other words, who, uh, who had the original document, who got the document next, and how did we end up with a copy of the document? Even if it's online, digitized, we need to ask that question as to where, where this document came from. And is this a copy of the original report or is this the actual original document that was created? So these are kind of the questions and they go to the same kinds of jargon. By the way, the, the trap here with the legal jargon is that they can be used to kind of answer these questions sometimes. And, and, they're, and, you, and you're being given the, the, the idea that by using the legal jargon, you're adding something to the analysis. And the answer to that is going back to what I said just moments ago, and that is the researcher is the one that makes the decision about whether the document is accurate or not. That has to do with, with the, the researcher doing the analysis, not with any third party that you're proving this to. You know, you don't, I, can, I suppose you could take that doc, that birth certificate and stick it in front of your, you know, sister's or aunt's face and say, see, I just proved that he was born on this date. No, you didn't. By the way, you didn't prove it. What you did was you found a document that had information that said that he was born on a certain date. That did not make that the date he was actually born or she or whoever. Okay, now back to the idea of these jurisdictions. The jurisdictions pile up like pancakes. They are um, basic. So if you were thinking of the times of, of different types of jurisdictions, for example, Here's an example of, of a set of jurisdictions. Uh, my, some of my ancestors were born in a place called Beaver, Utah. It's an, an, incor an incorporated community. It's an actual city. So there is a Beaver City, Utah, okay? That's one level. So there are records that may have been created by this entity, Beaver, Utah. There might be school districts, church, church subdivisions, different churches organized and other local organizations that also kept records and uh, were part of, uh, of the record keeping uh, area. The power districts, irrigation districts, hospital districts, these could be larger uh, areas than the, just the town of, of Beaver might be in a power district that took in a whole county or a whole Southern part of, Arizona, of Utah for that matter. 
Um, Beaver County is the next uh, subdivision. Uh, there are records created at each of these levels. This is what I'd say in the pancakes. And they're not duplicative. They're not the same records. There are records that are only created by the municipality. There are records only created by the school districts and the churches and other local organizations. And there are records that are only created by the county. So every one of these subdivision needs to be examined in doing your research. Then you have the state of Utah and the United States of America, and same thing. A United States of America document might be like uh, federal taxes, United States Army records, anything that, that was created on the U.S. Census. All of these are federal records that are not created on the local base, on the local level, even though they may contain very local and very specific local information. Now, why is it important to understand this when you're analyzing a document? Because you need to understand the level at which this document was created so you can determine what kind of responsibility they, the person who created the record had to be accurate or where they got the information. Okay, so this is kind of the, the, the concept here. And this list is open-ended. There's always more jurisdictions. There's always more areas to start looking for. I did a study not too long ago on uh, Utah, the number of agricultural organizations in the state. It turned out to be a long, long list of farm bureaus and all sorts of, of places that had collected information about the about people within the state. So, okay, so we're gonna look at here now at a US federal census record. Uh, this is probably one of the, what we call gateway records for genealogists. The first time that you uh, sit down to do your genealogy, whether you're here in the United States or some other place, you may begin looking through a census record uh, that was kept and uh, maintained by some government agency or the national government of that area. In this case, the federal census in the United States was begun in 1790, and it was up to 2020, and we're in the middle of having another census taken right now. And at the last published census is in 1940. It'll be another uh, approximately 11 years um, after uh, every 11 years, the uh, a new census or 12 years, a new census will be published. So we're looking for the 1950 census um, as the next one to be published. Question is this, for the basis of analyzing the, the documents uh, and looking at the United States census, do we just simply assume everything that was put into this census is, ac is correct, accurate, and complete? answer is hardly. And uh, there's lots of problems here with the census. And that's something that you run into almost immediately when you get into uh, learning about census records. So the first step, of course, is when you look at a new document like this, anything that you haven't looked at previously, if you're going to analyze that document, you need to learn about it. You need to learn where it came from, who created it, why they created it, uh, how long, uh, during what period of time it was created, uh, and um, how accurate it could possibly be, how much accuracy was there, and what was required, and what what actually happened in, in, um, in real practice when they started gathering census information. Well, in the United States federal census, for example, one thing you'll find out rather quickly is the uh, 1890 census uh, burned, partially burned in a fire. And then that uh, seems to be the excuse, but eventually the rest of what was saved from the fire was thrown away because the government failed to allocate funds and to actually preserve what was left. So we lost the vast majority of the 1890 census. So there's, they're not all infallible. They're, almost, they're not always there. And uh, learning about each of the individual kinds of records gives you the insight into being able to understand what kind of information is there, what can you expect to be accurate, and what can you expect to have some difficulties. Well, let's think of some common census problems. Uh, most of us could probably uh, come across 
with, uh, with a number of these after having worked with censuses for a while. And this isn't an exhaustive list, it's just an example of some of the questions that might arise. The dates and ages given in the census are off, usually by at least a year, and maybe a lot more. Why? Because people lied, because they misrepresented their age, because they simply did not old, know how old they were. They had no idea when they were born. And uh, they can give a different date. I've had people uh, that I've traced through the census records give a different age every time the census was taken. And so uh, that's one thing that you have to bear in mind. You, you put in a date, you don't have the date of birth. What you have is an approximate or an about date that will, uh, that will give you some information. So that's part of the idea here of analyzing a record. You, you know where there's a, a failing you know it's not gonna be correct. And so the value of the information that you get might be immense because it might give you a starting point for finding the person, uh, some record of their birth, but it certainly does not, is not uh, dispositive of the actual date. Uh, name spelling. Um, uh, I had people insist that they're, they're not related to uh, another party another person simply on the basis that the person spelled their name differently. Uh, names have absolutely nothing to do with relationship. Uh, names are fungible, meaning they can change and be sold and bought and, and, and gotten rid of. Uh, simplest thing is that uh, I've, uh, I've run into names that are spelled five different ways by five different members of the same family. So you just basically understand that the census record people were not the ones necessarily schooled in the, in the exact spelling of your ancestor's name. And uh, the early census records are, um, are basically uh, uh, given orally by the people who were, who were asking the questions and the census uh, enumerator, the person writing down the census information was taking down what they heard. So extraneous people living in the home. You can find all sorts of extra people floating around. Uh, you can't assume that automatically that, they're, that they are part of the family, even if they are listed as a son or daughter. They may not be a son or daughter. They may be a stepson and a stepdaughter, or they might be a nephew or a niece or they might just have been said, oh yeah, he's one of the kids, and they wrote him down as a son. Uh, we look at the 1880 census, and as we're going to analyze this document, we're going to pull out some information. And the first question that I had asked a moment ago was where, so we're gonna look at where this occurred. The number one there points at the page number and the supervisor's district number and the enumeration district. So you have a supervisor's district for the census and an enumeration district. And by the way, there are records that show you what those su supervisor districts were and the enumeration districts were, where they uh, organized the census takers, the enumerators. Um, also number two is uh, the actual place, in this case, it's uh, Beaver City Precinct, and uh, the precinct is uh, a, a subdivision of the town. So there's probably more than one precinct in this county of Beaver in the state of Utah, which is over on three and four. And then we have the date that it occurred, which is the 7th of June. But there's something that's more important here about census records, and that is the date on which the census was legally taken. And we have all of these places and we have a date of the report. But the next question is, what was the official census date for that census in that year in 1880? And it's right here and it says, the enumeration uh, who were living on the first day of June of 1880. And this particular one was taken on the seventh day. So what happens if somebody moved out between the 1st of June and the 7th day of June? Or what if a baby was born on the 7th day of June and where did they come from? Well, if this enumerator was doing their job, 
they would have listed only the people who were living on the first day of June. So if someone died or someone was born and it was after the first day of June, uh, if they were born after the first day of June, they weren't listed. If they were, if they died after the first day of June, but before the seventh day of June, maybe they were listed. So there's lots of things you need to know about this to analyze and see whether the information that you're looking at is even correct. Okay, so here's the, there's the same census schedule, and I'm just going to look at it and I'm going to say how many different jurisdictions does this census schedule refer to? directly or indirectly. And I'm just gonna run through the list real quick. The United States, the supervisors, enumeration district, state, county, precinct, foreign countries listed as birthplaces, states other than Utah listed, manufacturing organizations or companies listed under occupation, schools, farms, tradesmen, etc. Okay, now the next one, I'm gonna kind of move a little aside and go out and mention a, a, a subject. In analyzing any document, it's important to not forget cluster research, meaning that we look at people not as individuals living in an isolation in the middle of the desert with nobody around. We're looking at people who live in a community, live in a family, live in a society, and they have interactions with people as friends, family members, uh, business associates, um, and whatever. So in order to actually understand any given record, any, any record in the context of when it was created, you need to know about the community and begin to understand that there were people lived within this community and that they are, um, that they're best identified by putting them into the context of the community. So when you pull out a probate record, you've got a whole community listed on, on some probate records. Some probate records run to hundreds of pages long, and they include, um, for people with more wealth, they include huge long lists of property. And when they sell the property in the probates, there may be hundreds of people listed. And all of these people had direct information and association with the deceased and the deceased family. And so when we expand our concept of analyzing documents in the context of all the information that um, is available about the family and the community, then we can start to uh, put the, uh, find out whether or not the information in that particular record is, is believable and uh, consistent with what we know about the community, the larger community. In addition to that, in analyzing and looking at the document as comes from the list of all the jurisdictions that were in this one record, uh, they suggest all sorts of different places to go uh, to get additional information about this family and all the other families that are there. Understanding that when you're analyzing something like this census record, the census taker, the enumerator, went door to door down through the town. So the people who are listed next to your family are the neighbors. And maybe their neighbors are related, or maybe the neighbors would end up being the husbands or wives of the children. So you need to uh, analyze all of that information. And that's also part of what's called cluster research. So what about the idea of proof here? I included that in the terms that I wasn't happy with. Uh, here's a definition of proof. It's the evidence or argument establishing or helping to establish a fact or the truth of a statement. Okay, well, <clears throat> it's really a legal issue altogether. It has to do with uh, establishing facts or truth in the context of having someone there, like a judge or a jury, who will understand uh, listen to the evidence and make a decision as to whether or not they believe it is what it comes down to. And the only person that's that, that acts in that capacity, and I know I'm repeating this, but I'm going to think it's worth repeating, is the researcher, period, the researcher. So when I'm doing research and I find a document and I read it and I say, oh, I, I, that's correct, 
and then I record that information, and then I record the place where I, where I got the information, and I create a citation to that record so someone else can find it, then what does that do? Well, that means I'm now convinced that that's correct. Is everybody else in the world correct? Uh, convinced? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, so when I go to look at uh, a new record in a in someone's family tree, I always look at every all the sources. I go down through the sources and I say, how much information is there here that would lead me believe that the that it is correct that the conclusions made by the person putting the information into this family tree was correct. So that's that's the issue. What is called genealogical truth is nothing more or less than an opinion. It's an opinion. And um, if, if you can call it a proof, uh, you call it a proof statement, you can call it uh, my pr proof that someone is, uh, was the grandfather of so-and-so or whatever. But when you get down to it, all it is is your opinion that you've, you've created based on the documents that you've actually seen and that you've examined and the information that you've taken out of those documents. I could look at the same documents and come to a different conclusion. So how do you know if the, if the information in the documents is correct? That's the kind of the key question here. And the key question is, what if you have more than one document and they all disagree? Okay, the simplest one is where you have birth, birth dates recorded, like I said in the census record, and every census record, they gave a different birth date. Uh, you know, they, they said they were 40 years old, then they said they were 38 years old, and then the next year they said they were 51 years old, and then the next census year they said they were 57 years old, 67 years old. In other words, every year, even though 10 years passed, the the, the numbers never corresponded to uh, the correct date. So which of all those dates were correct? Take an average and divide it by the number of dates and come up no. See, the point being there that um, even when you have the doc documents that disagree, then you have to form an opinion for yourself and look at all the documents and look at an additional documents and keep looking until you find enough information that says, well, okay, so I know all these documents disagree, but I'm, I'm drawing the conclusion that this person was born between 1810 and 1815 because of this reason and this reason and this reason. Okay, now when you give those reasons, that helps other people understand what your thought process is, but that doesn't prove that the person was born between those two dates. All that does is give your opinion. And you can say about, I prove it because I have this document and this document and this document, and then this one showed that this and this, and so therefore I am correct. Okay, fine. But that doesn't really prove anything. All that does is say, you came to that conclusion, I may come to a different conclusion. So you need to decide which information is the most correct, and that's the decision-making process of doing genealogy is each time you make a decision. So let's say you find a birth certificate. Are you gonna record the date that's on the birth certificate? Absolutely, absolutely. That's the date, that's the information you have. You have no reason to suspect at that point that there's any other date that might be correct. The next document you find may have a different date for the birth. Then you have to make a decision and analyze both documents again to see which one you think is the most correct. I'm gonna repeat this, what I said a moment ago, people lie, people provide wrong information, and you can't, sometimes you can't even read the handwriting. So you don't know what it says. You don't know what the, the correct information is. So based on that, the way that you gain the ability to make this distinctions more, val more uh, accurately than you would otherwise is to practice. Practice and practice. That means look, what I said earlier about the case method, look at documents, every document. Keep looking at documents. The more you do that, the more time you spend looking at the actual documents, reading them, looking at the information and analyzing the information, it, the, the greater your skill 
in, in detecting what's correct and what's not correct will be. There are some genealogical skills like handwriting recognition, foreign languages, archaic terminology, and maps and geography that are absolutely essential to, to being able to analyze these documents. So if I handed you a document in Danish or in, in uh, German or in French, and you didn't read Danish or French or German, there would be no way you could tell me or determine if the information was correct or not because you couldn't even read the information. So basically the concept here is there's a lot of other skills we have to learn in order to get to the point where we actually can make an opinion as to whether or not the document is correct or not and look at the information and analyze the information that's in there. So we acquire the skills necessary by going to classes and webinars, by looking at books and reading books about genealogy and about records and learning about what, the, what kind of accuracy there is in records and not in records. And we spend time in libraries and archives where the records are located so we can uh, look at more information and gather more information. And then we ask for help. We uh, go to people who have been doing this for an extended period of time and they say, look at this document. And they will go, oh, well, it says right here, the person was born in 1697. And you go, oh, is that what that number is? Okay. So this is the kinds of things that we need to, to know about and to learn about. And here's some specific resources that'll probably help you. First of all, if you need to get started and you don't understand the process, then we have the Family History Guide, which is the fhguide.com. And it is uh, a free structured educational website. It has thousands of resources and links out to articles and, and, uh, and videos for information. We have our BYU Family History Library YouTube channel. We have uh, about 480, we're getting up close to 500 videos on that channel. And uh, looks like with the number we're going to be doing this summer that we'll probably have uh, well over 500 sometime this, uh, the next little while. Uh, there are formal university level classes. Um, I, um, I usually don't mention this, but uh, I spent about five years taking uh, independent study classes from Brigham Young University on family history. And I went through a lot of very, very difficult and very challenging classes and learned a tremendous amount of information out of those classes. So those are the kinds of things that help you get to be to the position where you can, uh, you can adequately and accurately analyze these documents. Okay, well, thank you for watching. Um, I might mention this, that I have been writing a series on the same subject on Genealogy Star, which will probably keep going for quite some time. So if you wanna look at my blog, uh, Genealogies with a apostrophe S star, and uh, then you can, uh, you can follow along and, and get a lot more in-depth information than I can present in an hour. Also remember as, uh, Brian said that this is, uh, these webinars are posted on our BYU YouTube, BYU Family History Library YouTube channel, and that um, you can look at them at your leisure and go back and, and review what's said. Um, lots of information out there, quite overwhelming actually. Okay, well, are there any questions that we wanna to answer today? Hopefully I didn't put everybody to sleep instantly. So somebody was awake long enough to have a question. It looks like we have one question. It's from Mardi, it says, or it's from Rose Scott. Could you give the blog address again? Um, I didn't give the blog address. The, the family history guide is the FH guide dot com, the T-H-E-F-H guide, G-U-I-D-E dot com. And, the, and uh, Genealogy Star uh, is a long one. It's uh, Genealogy Star at, at blog, you know, dot blogspot dot com. But um, 
It's G-E-N-E-A-L-O-G-Y-S-S-T-A-R. Just look that up. Look up Genealogy Star. Look up my name, James Tanner and Genealogy, and you'll find a lot of references to it. So it's pretty easy to find just by doing Google search. Okay. Looks like that's it. Yep. If there's no more questions, then thanks so much, James, for your presentation. And we'd like to remind everyone about our webinar uh, coming up next week on, or this week, actually, <laughs> on Friday at 4 p.m. That'll be Utah Digital Newspapers with Jeremy Minty. So be sure to join us for that. Um, thank you for joining today, and we hope you have a great day.